Now, Japan's nuclear crisis is still a troubling mystery with daily more revelations of meltdowns and failures. As a result, Germany has just declared it will phase out nuclear power by 2020. But will other countries follow? And what is the future for nuclear power in an ever-hungry energy world? Dr Ziggy Switkowski is the former chairman of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Tonight he'll present a lecture on nuclear energy, energy post-Fukushima at Melbourne's Swinburne University and he joins us now. Ziggy Switkowski, good to see you again. Morning, Virginia. Michael? One of the things I admire about you is no matter what's going on in the world and what might be happening in Fukushima, you're still reasonably optimistic <laughs> about nuclear power in this country, aren't you? Well, look, I think the debate in Australia is continuing. Uh, Do you? You really don't think it's being killed dead by Japan? No, I don't. In fact, the, the conversation now is even better informed because of the saturation coverage of Fukushima and the, and the aftermath. So the Australians are now more aware of the nuclear fuel cycle and the advantages and the risks. Yeah. It's fair to say that uh, the growing kind of optimism about nuclear power in Australia has stalled. Uh, Fukushima has taken care of that, yep. and it's it's you know we're, we're very very far away from getting any kind of a political consensus around nuclear power. But the time will come. It may be some years down the line, where the reality of uh, the move to uh, a clean energy economy will force us to contemplate nuclear energy. But how long will this take? Are we, are we talking decades here? Because well, it, it has made a big impact on not just the Australian psyche, but uh, people around the world. To some extent, Michael, it depends upon how seriously we take our uh, emissions reduction targets. I mean, it's one thing to lay out aggressive targets for 2050. It's another to connect the dots between here and now with the technologies that are going to deliver. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that, are hap that is happening now in Japan and Germany that are looking at a future with less nuclear power or no nuclear power is what will... Uh, substitute for nuclear in a, in a way that's as clean. The feeling is that'll be more solar energy, uh, more wind, and if those countries' efforts uh, cause breakthroughs to happen, that might pave the way for Australia to follow. But in absent that, the, the, the journey is, is inevitably going to cause us to include nuclear power in our planning. I'll declare a bias here as I'm the daughter of an electrical engineer who was involved in designing Yulon W, one of the big coal-fired power stations in the country. And so I understand coal and I know it. And I know that we have hundreds and hundreds of years of coal resources in this country. We don't need to worry about energy security if we can just get that t technology clean. I know that China has done it with new plants that they've put in place. Could not a new wave of technological development in this country actually push nuclear even further onto the back burner? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you were taking just an, uh, an Australian national view, then the highest priority for us should be ways in which we can continue to burn coal and gas cleanly. And that means... And it is possible, isn't it? Well, carbon capture and sequestration is a big national research effort at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I must say, with the passage of time, the, tech, the technical hurdles there look larger rather than smaller. And the efforts around the world seem to be reinforcing that. So, but the contribution to our economy from keeping coal going would be huge. But as importantly, from the global climate point of view, if we could find a way to capture emissions and store them safely and make that technology retrofitable on other countries' plants, that would be the biggest single contribution we could make to the global challenge. The next biggest would be to make uh, our uranium available safely to more countries. How expensive is carbon capture vis-à-vis -vis, uh, building nuclear power plants, which are well, very, very expensive? Well, uh, if uh, the, the cost of uh, generating nuclear electricity in Australia at the generator level would be 50 to 100 per cent higher than it would be to uh, produce the same electricity with coal. And, and in Australia, every alternative to coal is much more expensive. Mm. But adding carbon capture and storage onto existing plants would be a multiple of that higher at this stage. Now it's clear if you get technical breakthroughs, more countries uh, adopt it and improve it, the costs of carbon capture and storage will come down. But at this stage, it does look formidably complicated and costly. Are there very fast and very important lessons being quickly learned from Fukushima by the international atomic energy industry? Well, at this uh, the answer is yes, although I'm not sure that the lessons in an environment where you had a magnitude 9 earthquake and a 14 metre tsunami have global relevance and probably arguably not too much for Australia because... Because well, we're more geologically stable. Well, we're, we're, we're stable. We don't have a history of, of, of tsunamis. We have uh, lots and lots of spaces away from population centres where, which might be good locations for nuclear power plants. But there's, the various groups that are going through Fukushima at the moment uh, are pointing to the fact that Japan was ill-prepared for tsunamis of that magnitude and should have been. 
uh, and that the recovery processes and the, and the management of the uh, emergency reaction uh, uh, protocols uh, uh, could be improved. But it also brought to our attention the fact that, and I think uh, Fukushima is not just isolated in this, so many of the spent fuel rods are still stored on location because you can't find anywhere to put them. They just stay at the nuclear plant and that exacerbated the problem. Now, we don't have a solution to that. Well, we don't have nuclear power here, but even if we did, the argument about where the fuel would go, where, where the spent fuel would go, would just be endless. And it is, but it is a social argument. It's not a technical argument. I mean, the well, story... that made it a technical argument. Well, it, it, <laughs> fair enough. In, in Fukushima, for the first time, the storage of spent fuel was compromised by the tsunami and earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. which is uh, without, without precedent and can be fixed. But, the, but you're right. When you're, when you're talking about the appeal of nuclear power, opponents of nuclear power usually point to long-lived radioactive waste and where will you store it. The, the siting uh, of national repositories is really a problem. But getting community uh, consensus around the desirability of having such a repository uh, is always a problem, particularly when you're doing it for the first time. I think in the next 10 years, countries like uh, Great Britain, France, uh, Sweden, Finland, the US, will have working national repositories. And in Australia's case, we wouldn't need one for another 50 to 70 years. We would learn from the experiences of these other countries, pick the best in class design, and probably construct something in central Australia. But I don't deny that the social uh, issues of, of persuading uh, politicians and communities as to the merits uh, remain high. We keep hearing from officials in Japan that the crisis there is essentially over. Are you so sanguine? Look, I described the situation in, uh, in, in Japan in Fukushima as being uh, stable but not in control. Uh, but look, let's define the crisis. Um, there have been no casualties in Fukushima, none. Uh, in an environment where 25,000 people have been killed or, or, or still missing? No, it's my understanding that there actually has been a death of a worker who was involved immediately uh, in the aftermath of one of the blasts there were at three, Fukushima. Three people on site have died yes. from the earthquake and tsunami, but none associated with the operation of the reactors you mean that I know of. Nuclear fallout, you mean, or, or radiation yeah, or radiation sickness. exposure. Okay. So there's been no uh, reactor-related... Yes. Uh, Casualties, not that's only a, that's deaths, a, that's, but casualties. That's a yet issue, of course, because yeah. it can be developed over time. Yes, although uh, the workers on site and the community around Fukushima are being very, very carefully monitored. And although the early emergency... Oh, Dr Swikowski, I'm sorry, I can't let that one pass, because I mean, I, I know this sim from simply from, from news footage I've seen myself, that a, a great number of older people in that area were simply abandoned and left within the exclusion zone and were there for, for a long period of time. So I can't accept that they were looked after. No, no, I'm not saying that, but I don't think there's been a measurable impact upon community health as a result of the impact of the fallout and the radiation releases out of Fukushima. There have been emergency workers that have been exposed to uh, excessive levels of radiation yes. and they are being tracked. The excessive levels of radiation uh, appear to be probably not, uh, probably not lead to long-term health effects, but we don't know. If you then go outside uh, the, the plant itself, where there are now hundreds of workers, and you look at the hundreds of thousands of people that lived in the vicinity and all the way down south to, to Tokyo, it's unlikely that we'll ever see a measurable impact upon the health of the communities. That's not to say that statistically you shouldn't be able to calculate that there will be a higher incidence of certain types of illnesses and cancers. So that's true. But when you try to put parameters around this particular disaster, um, we know, we know what, the, what the impact upon the community and people has been. It's been minimal. There is an economic impact. You've got to replace the generating capacity. You've got to uh, rehabilitate the site. The cost of that's going to be tens of billions of dollars. Um, I think if you're going to look at this in a constructive way, from my point of view, you'd say if this is the worst it can be, and it seems to be just about the worst kind of combination of circumstances, then we can evaluate the risks and the costs and compare those with our alternatives and then form a view. I think I'd like to sit here for the next half an hour and argue through virtually every point that you made there, but Damn it, I can't because of the time. <laughs> can you come back so we can have another go around sure on this? Thing. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank Dr. Sikowski, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.